Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, today I just wanted to remind you, um, the Bible teaches us that sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The King James Bible is God's perfect written word in English. But the point I'm making here is, is when you truly get saved and born again, you're going to have to come to the realization that everything that you, the way you used to look at things, the way you used to do things, whether they're traditions of men, rudiments of the world, um, you have to re, you have to judge everything all over again, according to this book right here. Everything. My whole life when I got saved, it took a couple years to really, for to see the huge, you saw a big change at the beginning, but the, to get a lot of the big stuff out of my life that God wanted out of my life, sin, traditions of man, rudiments of the world, um, false teachings, the lies I've been taught when I was a false convert in the battle buildings, I had to get to a point where I realized I knew nothing and said, Lord, show me the truth. And everything in my life had to be brought into question. And it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. But everything got brought into question eventually. And I had to make sure that my life fully and completely lines up with the scriptures. Now lately there's this big push, this big push for culture. It's all about culture. There's culture everywhere in the Bible. The Bible's just nothing about culture, culture. God just loves culture. And instead of just taking the word of God for what it is. And what's this study going to be about? Um, was Martin Luther the first person to do a Christmas tree? Okay. Um, remember, this is our final authority. This is our foundation, not traditions of men. Okay. I put out a challenge to Brother Brian at King James. Well, it's not King James Video Ministries anymore, and rightly so. It's Born Again Barbarian. Um, but I put a challenge up to Brother Brian with, when it came to Christmas, when it came to the Christmas tree, I said, why won't he do a full-on study of the Christmas tree? And I gave an example of his work in the past. I, I showed you, Brother Sister Christ, his study on Halloween. Okay, how he did a thorough study, how he compared it to the scriptures. Law first mentioned what Halloween really comes from, so no matter how innocent they try to make it out to be, or how they try to put a rubber Jesus stamp on it and Christianize it, he showed it for what it was. He did a thorough, hardcore study on it. Now, I put that same challenge to Brother Brian, and recently he came out with a video, um, The Origins. See if I can... Uh, I just don't want to give a false title. What is the real origin of the Christmas tree? Okay, he came out with that, and I want to respond to that video because I still it just proves my point that he re, he refuses to do a full on hardcore study on it. the the true origins of the Christmas tree. He doesn't want to do the full on study, but we're going to talk about some of the things he said in here, and one of the things he said was is. He leaves it like a question. He leaves the authority in your hands, not in God's hands, not in the Word of God, not in absolute truth, not going over the facts of history. He's just kind of leaving it in your hands. What do you think? Question mark. And what he does is he talks about the story of Martin Luther's Christmas tree. So I'm going to be honest with you. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about where it goes back even further than that. Okay. So, uh, remember... You're going to have to, the practices that you have and the things that you were doing when you were lost, as you get saved and God starts working with you, remember, everything in your life comes into question and you have to start asking God, is this what I'm supposed to be doing, Lord? Is this okay, Lord? Is that okay? Am I, have the, I can't tell you how many times, Brother Sister Christ, in the past, as a false convert, I was told one thing. And this is okay, that's okay. And then when I truly got saved and born again and started going off the scriptures, this is my final authority in all matters of faith and practice. I live my life, I do my best to live my life towards the, according to the Word of God. 
And when I fail the Lord, you repent, you forsake, and you get back to that to the way. The Bible talks about the way, the narrow path. You get back to serving the Lord and living for the Lord. But this defines how we're supposed to live as Christians. This defines our life now. Not traditions of men, not culture, not heritage. This right here defines us. This right here is what separates us from the lost world. Remember that. The story of Martin Luther, Christmas tree. Prince Albert. Okay, I'm just reading the article that was there. And these articles that I found, they are secular. They're not biased in any way. They're not saved. They're not Christians. And they're not attacking it. And they're not saying they're 100% for it. They're just stating the, the gossip. Because the, the, we'll see the word in here. It's just gossip is what it is. Okay, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's consort is usually credited with having introduced the Christmas tree into England in 1840. He was the first one to do the Christmas tree. However, the honor of establishing this tradition in the United Kingdom rightly belongs to the good, to put in quintesis, good Queen Charlotte, the German wife of George III, who set up the first known English tree at Queen's Lodge, Windsor, in December 1800. She's German. So where'd she get it from? Legend has it... Remember the key words there. I mean, words have meaning. One of the things about this ministry, Brother Sister Christ, is that words have meaning. Legend has it... That right there, is that a good start? No, it isn't. Legend has it that Queen Charlotte's compatriot, Martin Luther, the religious reformer, invented the Christmas tree. In other words, it's not off scripture, it's man-made. One winter night in 1536, so the story goes, Luther was walking through a pine forest near his home in Wittenberg when he suddenly looked up and saw thousands of stars glinting jewel-like among the branches of the trees. Now, I look at the stars at night, brothers says Christ. I lay out there and I look at the stars. I count the moving stars. I count shooting stars. I'll lay out there for an hour to two hours at night, in the, mainly in the springtime, where it's not too cold, it's not too hot, and then in the fall time, where it gets to the point where it's not too hot, not too cold. Um, but I love sitting out there underneath the stars for hours, talking with the Lord, listening to the Bible being read by Alexander Scorvey, listening to wordless music and talk to the Lord. And I've seen during the day, I've looked at the, at the sun shining through the trees. It's not the same thing. I've seen trees that get wet, where you have that rain where the sun is sticking out and shining. And the trees get wet and they start sparkling like diamonds. But I'm telling you, that's not the same thing. As I actually sat and looked out at the stars. That's not the same thing. But, but the thing is, I don't have snow here. So, um, but I can see how it might remind somebody of the stars. I'm not trying to put that down completely. It might remind someone of the stars. But I'm just telling you, from someone who actually lays out underneath the stars, there's, no th there's nothing to compare to it. And if you, don't, if you ever have the opportunity to do it, lay out underneath the stars and talk with the Lord. Okay? It's a beautiful thing. In its natural state. But here's the thing. He's showing that he sees this glinting. And it's winter time. Right? So it's probably snow in the trees. So the sun is trying to shine through the snow. Now I don't know. But I've seen pictures of snow. Where the sun shines through it. And I don't know if it sparkles like it does with the rain. When there's dr wet drops in the trees. And when the sun shines through it. Those sparkle. You know. But I don't know how it is with snow. Because we don't get snow here that much anymore. Okay, but this is what he's trying to say. He's, he's looking at this and it's reminding him of something. It's reminding him of the stars. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. This wondrous sight inspired him to set up candlelit fir tree in his house that, that, that Christmas. Now stop for a second. What was Martin Luther? He was a Catholic. Who created the term Christmas? I've proven this in a study that Brian won't ever do. I've proven this. Brother Brian King James Vitt, her born-again barbarian. A born-again barbarian, he won't do. 
the term Christmas, the title Christmas for a holiday, which I call holidays, but holiday, was created by the Catholic Church. This only proves that Martin Luther was a Catholic coming and God was bringing him out of Catholicism. Some people think, well, he might not have been truly saved, and I can understand that. Because you've got to understand, he was a Catholic. And back then, they were hardcore Catholics. Not like today. Oh, you can be a Catholic and have the world and do what you want. No, back then, tradi their papal traditions and the commandments of men, that was the law in the Catholic Church. It was the words of men that, that dictate the law. Okay? But the term Christmas was created in 300, between 300 and 400 A.D. by the Catholic Church. Proven. Okay. So then you have Martin Luther, a man that's coming out of, remember this is just a legend, but a man coming out of Catholicism, celebrating Christmas. Yeah. And that's how it got put in the Reformation, that, because they didn't want to get away from Catholicism completely, they wanted to reform Catholicism. They still wanted to keep some of the papal traditions and the pagan practices of Catholicism. Building a Babel building and calling it a church, having temples built with hands. Sunday best. Christmas is one of them. Okay. But like I said, looking at those trees, if this is a true story, looking at those trees and see the sparkling and saying that reminds me of the stars and it's so beautiful, Lord, the sunset, what I call the gold, I get silver and gold all the time. I talk about it, Brother Jesus Christ. I look down at the water and only at a certain time during the day when I eat my lunch, I can sit out there if it's partly cloudy or clear skies and you can get the light shining off the water, and it's silver. And God blesses me with silver, and then in the morning, I call it the morning gold, or the evening gold, when the sun's just coming up, the clouds, if there's some clouds, they'll look gold. And um, when the sun's going down, the clouds will look gold. Uh, the sun, the, the light of the sun changes as it's shining on the trees as it's going down. If it's up all the way, it's just like regular light. But when it gets to the point where it gets to the horizon, it gets to a darker gold light, and it shines off the trees, and I look at the trees and everything in that dark, and I call it the gold, you know. I look at that, it's a, it was God created, and I give God glory for that beauty, and I give God thanks for sharing it with me. But I would never do what they claim Martin Luther did, okay? This wondrous sight inspired him to set up candlelit fir trees in his house that Christmas to remind his children of the starry heavens from whence the, their Savior came. I would never take something like that and try to turn it into an idol. And remember, why don't I have crosses in my house? Because the Bible, the Word of God, says that the cross is a curse. Curses is every man that hangeth upon a tree. They were cursing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when they hung Him on that tree, on the cross. He who took on the sins of the world, He was cursed. Okay? And today, that cross has been turned into a um, pagan idol. I don't have anything to do with a physical cross in my house. I will talk about the cross all the time. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll talk about the cross. I'll talk about what Jesus went through on the cross. But I will not take that and turn it into a pagan item, an idol, in my home and say, that's Jesus that reminds me of Jesus, therefore that's Jesus. All right. The Savior came, and here's the thing. Remember, when the Bible in Genesis says God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. There's three heavens. And I'll go through it again. There's the heaven from what we see to the clouds, the sky, the blue sky, how it turns blue, and everything during the day, and everything. The sky. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is from that point on to where you see the stars. You can only see them at night because the blue dissipates and gets cleared out, and you can see the stars at night. That's the second heaven. What's the third heaven? Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You mean Jesus is in God's house right now? Where's that at? I go to prepare a place for you. And he says he'll come back to get us someday, to take us to our real home. That's the third heaven. That's heaven. That's where God's throne is. That's where Jesus is. 
So here he's saying that the, the, the legend is saying that it reminds children of the starry heavens from whence their Savior came. So, so Jesus came from the second heaven. No, he came from the third heaven. Right? The heaven we can't see. Right? But like I said, I have no problem with looking at something that God created and saying it's so beautiful, so wonderful. But when you try to take that and bring it in and turn it into a idol to remind you of God, I don't need that. We have God's perfect written word and it said we're supposed to hide God's word in our heart. Jesus is with me and goes through everything I go through. Which is a big reminder when it comes to sin, brother and sister Christ. When you're sinning, Jesus is, is with you, watching you do that sin. He's with you, in, not just in the hard times, but He's with you when you choose to sin. He's with you in the good times. He's with you when you're going through suffering and persecution. He's always with you. You, should, you don't need a physical idol to remind you of that. In fact, that starts pulling you away from the Word of God and believing that Jesus is in here, and you start looking to that idol. And you keep looking at that idol and looking at that idol. Right. Certainly, let's keep going, certainly by 1605, decorated Christmas trees had made their appearance in southern Germany. For in that year, an anonymous writer... Do you really like these words? That you're going to base... You're going to ignore the words of God and, and, and choose traditions of men, and this is your tradition, legend, anonymous writer. Some people say... In other words, who knows what the truth is? What is truth? In other words, we've got to become like Pontius Pilate. What is truth? Okay. We know what truth is. We have it right here. But people are acting, brethren are acting like they don't have the truth. What is truth? What is truth? An honest writer recorded how a yuletide, the inhabitants of Strasbourg, set up fir trees in, the par in their parlors and hang thereon rows cut out of many colors Paper, apples, apples, remember that. Wafers, remember that too, it's a fruit. Uh, gold foiled, sweets, gold foil, you know, like silver and gold. Decking that tree with silver and gold. Oh, no, 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 it's not decked, it's not decked, it's gilded. Uh, you can go ahead and keep playing the scribe all you want, brother. In the end, you're going to lose. All right. It's just that simple. But remember, apples and wafers, they were putting fruits on the tree. That's important. Okay. In other parts of Germany, box trees or yews were brought indoors at Christmas instead of firs. And in the Dutch of Mecca, I can't pronounce that, per, forgive me, by, by, by brothers in Christ in Germany, um, Meckensburg, Strelitz, where Queen Sh Sh Charlotte grew up. You know, we talked about Queen Charlotte up there, where she's in England, and that's how it got brought to England from Germany. Grew up. It was the custom to deck out a single yew branch. If you don't want to do a huge tree, you can do a yew branch. You take a branch, and you deck that out, and you hang it above the doorway. Then it became wreaths. Well, you try to put it in a circle, and you hang it on the door. Wouldn't you just say, I am the door? What did the Jewish people have to do? They had to strike blood from a lamb, sacrifice, on the top and the two side posts. This plays a big part in this as we keep going. It does. It's a counterfeit. I'm going to get ahead of myself. This tree is ultimately, the more I study this, the more I realize it's a counterfeit for the tree of life. And it's a counterfeit for Jesus Christ. Not that it looks like Jesus Christ. I'm saying when it comes to, and I'm gonna get, I'll go ahead, I guess I'm going to get ahead of myself. When it comes to finding everlasting life, when you want true life, instead of going through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you make counterfeits. Mm -hmm. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware. Brother says Christ, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. And what does that do? That keeps you from going after Christ. The Bible says, and not after Christ. 
Someone goes, I'm doing this to remember Jesus Christ and whence he came from. We go chapter and verse. Because when you, when, like I said, when you apply his story to the Bible, it just falls apart. It's not going off the word of God. It's going off his feelings and opinions. Just feelings and opinions. Feelings and opinions. But remember the single you branch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the one thing I want to point out is at least Brian is now admitting that it's traditions of men. I mean, he was asked in a live chat once, and he came out and said, most recent, I think it was most recent live chat, that Brother Brian at um, uh, Born Again Barbarian, I hate that title, I, I love King James Video Ministries, because that's his foundation in all matters of faith and practice, King James Bible, King James Video Ministries. Okay. That's why I named my, the ministry that God's blessed me with being a part of Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries, because this is our foundation, not me, this is. Um, but at least he's admitting, he admitted that it's just traditions of men. Christmas and the practices that come along Christmas, at least now he's admitting it's just traditions of men. It's a start. It's just, I mean, it's a start for us trying to reach him for absolute truth. He's admitting that it's just traditions of men. Mm -hmm. It's not a commandment of God, nor does it, the Bible say you do this to please God. The Bible doesn't say you do this to please God. It's just traditions of men, rudiments of the world, feelings and opinions. Okay. Matthew 12, 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. My next challenge I would give Brother Brian is this. If you are coming out and being honest now, praise the Lord, and you're admitting that this is just traditions of men, rudiments of the world, but he likes to use the word culture, um, let me ask you, what's more important? That rudiment of the world, that traditions of men, or fellowship with the brethren? What's more important? If you're now admitting it's just traditions of men, it's rudiments of the world, and it, and it, and it offends a lot of the brethren, why don't you give it up? And love your brother in Christ over loving yourself and your flesh. By thy words thou shalt be justified, by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I've said this before. If, the only thing I will never give up is this right here. But if I had to sell this home to go be part of a house church, to help out at a house church, if I had to give, away, give up this beautiful place that God has let me live in, and I had to give this up to go into a city, to live in a studio apartment or a little you know, square 200-foot <laughs> studio apartment, and be part of a house church... I do it because of my love for the brethren. None of this stuff matters. Okay? I can't take it with me when I go to heaven. And I don't want to take it with me when I go to heaven. The only one thing I want going to heaven is you, brothers and sisters of Christ, my loved ones, my neighbors, you know, the lost. I want as many lost people to get saved as possible. Those are who I want to go with us <laughs> when we go to heaven. But I, this, all this junk here, it's not worth it. Okay? So once again, when I challenged him, instead of going to the scriptures to prove the Christmas tree, uh, that it glorifies God, that it pleases God, and that it's a just, right thing to do for a Christian, he goes to traditions of men. Okay. Instead of going to the scriptures to prove a Christmas tree honors God and is something a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman should, should or can do, instead, I'm going to go to traditions of men and rudiments of the world. Feelings and opinions. Thus saith my personal preferences. Thus saith my flesh. Remember, when someone today says, I had a vision. I have a dream. I have a vision. And I'm going to do this for the Lord. He told me I need to build this building and call this building a church and then invite both saved and lost to it. I'm trying to do that charismatic. Invite both saved and lost to it. And we need to wear our Sunday best. And you need to be given your 20, 10 or 20 percent tithe. And, and, and God showed me this in a vision that we need to do. What are we supposed to do, brothers and sisters in Christ? What's our attitude supposed to be? Acts 17.10 says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And there were there more than... 
And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. I'm all for receiving this. Brian's saying, hey, is this where the first Christmas tree came? I'm all for receiving this. But then I compare it with Scripture. What are they doing? Ready to mind and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They were preaching Jesus to them, so they're going to the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies, prophesying Jesus to say, This is the way of eternal life. You want to be saved? Do you want to have eternal life? You want to be right with our God? Because these are Jews, our capital G God and Savior. You need to go through Jesus Christ. That's supposed to be our response. And like I said, I'm so, if I got a little too uh, heated um, in my uh, defending, you know, defending the Word of God when it comes to Christmas series studies, I apologize, Brothers Brian, but I just get so frustrated because that was always the foundation of King James Video Ministries. Thus saith the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. You compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. You don't just grab one verse and, and make it out to be anything you want it to be. Okay? You don't do that. But now, now, you know, now it's okay to do that. Take verses, just take what words that you want out of the verse and that's it. Or just take a verse out of context, ignore the chapter that it came in, and just make a mess of Scripture. Because it's not, now you're being motivated by your feelings and your opinions. By traditions of men and rudiments of the world. That's your motivation. Not the Holy Spirit and having a love of the absolute truth and saying this is God's truth regardless of what it tells me. If it means I have to give something up, I'll give it up. This is the absolute truth. That standard, what happened to it? What happened to it? That's the frustration I have because I love my brother in Christ, Brother Brian at King James Vitor. I keep saying Old King James Video Ministries, the new Brian of, 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 of the uh, born again barbarian. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'm going to say it. Sometimes I feel, and hear me out, sometimes I feel like that isn't Brother Brian, that's a Jesuit. You say, oh, You're saying Brother Brian's a Jesuit? No, I'm not. I'm saying there's times I look and I'm like, I'm waiting for us to find the real Brother Brian from old King James Video Ministries tied up in a closet somewhere. And this is a fake and a fraud that's in front of us because I just, this isn't Brian. Brian had such a love of the Word of God. He had such a passion for ministry. What happened? Now it's all culture, culture, culture. Traditions of men, culture. Rudiments of the world. What happened? Brian should be doing what I'm doing. He should be comparing Scripture with Scripture. He should be correcting me for saying, I'm not following, you know, comparing Scripture with Scripture if I'm not doing it. It's frustrating, brothers and sisters. It's frustrating. In these last days, we need brethren to stay strong and to continue to stand for absolute truth. And we see there's a falling away and it's starting to affect men we thought it would never affect. And it breaks my heart and it's tearing me up inside. Okay? But remember, when someone today says, I have a vision, or they're trying to say, this is okay for a Christian to do or anything, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to check the scriptures to see if those things are so. Okay. Covetousness, which is idolatry, does that please God? That's what Chris, the Christmas tree, the Christmas practices. Does idolatry, idols, false gods, spiritual fornication, does that please God? No, it does not. When you check the scriptures, you say, oh, I'm going to go with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I would ask, Martin Luther isn't here today, but I'd ask Martin Luther, I'd be like, why did you do that? Why are you doing that and turning it into an idol and everything? He'd probably say, eh, it just felt like the right thing to do. It feels good. So I did it. It just made me feel good. Honestly, I kind of hope he'd say, you know what, you've got a point. If I could talk to Martin Luther, you've got a point. I, I guess that's, I'm still working hard to come out of Catholicism. And you doing papal traditions and having to have physical images there to remind me of Jesus, of, of our religion and, and everything. That I just don't hold his word in my heart. And I sit there and I look at the, his creation in its natural state and just be content with that. Thank you, Lord. You exist. This didn't happen by accident. Okay. Now here's the thing, brothers and sisters Christ. He is left off there. That's not how we're going to leave off, because I'm not going to just tell you a half-truth. 
Okay? There's that side of it. People believe that it was Martin Luther that came up with the Christmas tree. But I still like to say, legend, anonymous writer, I still like to point out that he was coming out of Catholicism, papal traditions, and struggling with putting the word first because God was just starting to work on him and everything, that transition. Same thing with John Wesley. You look at a lot of things with them and it's like, I think he's lost. Well, you got, I, I have grace for this fact. He's coming out of Catholicism. Um, I've, read, I've got a book on him, and I've got, um, I understand there were some things he did that looked pa uh, Catholic and papal, but you got to understand, he's coming out of Catholicism. He started out doing a lot of things that were Catholicism, and then he started giving it up. Okay, I gave that up, because the word, it goes against the Word of God and the ministry, preaching the ministry of reconciliation. I had to give this up. I had to get, and it just, it's a process. Sanctification is a process. Okay. But let's talk about the history of the Christmas tree. The real history as it goes as far back as we can take it. Okay. The history of the Christmas tree goes back to the symbolic use of evergreens in ancient Egypt and Rome. See, this is something Brian won't tell you. Okay. These are two good books I've got here. <clears throat> This one's still in its packaging because I read this and haven't gotten around to reading the Alexander Hislop. Okay. Now people will say, well, this has got some errors in it. Well, I'm pretty sure this has some errors in it too. This is uh, Babylon Religion, How Babylonian Goddess Became the Virgin Mary, David Daniels, illustration by Jack Chick. Okay. I'm sure this has errors in it. You want something that's perfect, brothers and sisters in Christ? There you go. But the thing is, is brethren have a problem with this lately. I don't know why, but it seems like you guys are having a problem with this. You want a perfect book? Here you go. But when it comes to man's history, this has, it's a history book as well as a book of truth and fact, a book of faith, a book of prophecy. It's a book of everything. This is absolute truth. But this is talking about history. Satan's history, okay? We just read there, along uh, before the advent of Christianity, oh no, I skipped a verse. <laughs> the history of the Christmas tree goes back to the symbolic use of evergreens in the ancient Egypt and Roman Rome, and continues with the German tradition of candlelit Christmas trees, first brought to America in 1800. Discovering, so you discover the history of the Christmas tree from the early winter solstice celebration to Queen Victoria. Decorating habits and the annual lighting of the Rockefeller Center tree in the New York City. All these satanic, Satan-worshipping people are hardcore about the Christmas tree. But don't let that persuade you. Oh no, don't let that persuade you. But these two books prove and show how it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Mystery Babylon was the, the fallen religion. You have... Um, um, Nimrod, Samaramus, and Tammuz. I want to thank the Lord. Sorry, I just want to thank the Lord. My memory's not always that best, that good. Thank you, Lord. Samaramus, Nimrod, and Tammuz, the first pagan trinity. Okay? And they set up their kingdom, and they're counterfeiting everything that God does. That's what Satan does. What's one of the things in the Garden of Eden that God had that gave eternal life? That they counterfeited? Ooh, that, that'd be the tree of life. Okay. I, I suggest both these books. Like I said, I haven't got to this book yet. You say, why do you suggest it? Because I, I have a brethren that have read it that I trust, and I've read this one. Okay. When you read this one, and then I start getting into ministry, I spend more time in the book, this book here, Absolute Truth, <laughs> no errors, than I have time for reading this, because i got books galore, books galore over there, and half the books I have on that shelf, I've read. <laughs> the other half are sitting there for the days where I just... God really puts it on my heart. Okay, it's time to, I'll give you time, and you can read it. Okay. But these two books, talk about it. And like I said, I'm not saying these two books are absolute truth. and I'm saying you should read them because they show to the best of their ability, because we weren't there back then. It shows to the best of our ability how Mystery Babylon, from, uh, like I said, Samur uh, Nimrod, Samaramis, and Tammuz, the pagan trinity, went over to Egypt and became um, uh, three false gods there. Then it went to the Roman Empire, where they had their three false gods. 
okay? It's like Zeus and this and that, um, the three false gods. Um, and then it came into the Catholic Church where they changed those three false gods to God, the, their version of God the Father and God the Son, which is, and God the Holy Spirit. It's their pagan trinity. Okay. That's where the Christmas tree comes from. You go back to the first law of first mention, law of first mention, brothers and sisters Christ. Long before the advent of Christianity, plants and trees. Remember, like I said, this was just from a sect of Christianity. Go, it's talking about even before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not what they're saying, but they're saying before Christianity, that's what, they're, according to the scriptures, Christianity started. Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. True Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women were called Christians. Today that word's been perverted. But the, even before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay, plants and trees that remain green all year had a special meaning for the people in winter. Remember the Christmas tree. I mean, remember the tree of life. Because I want to talk about it and ask you guys what you think about some things. Now, I'm not making you the final authority. This is the final authority. But it doesn't ever tell us what that tree looked like or what kind of fruit was on that tree. Right. It just calls it the tree of life. We know it is a tree. And we know it had fruit that was edible. Because uh, sometimes I bring freeze. Adam and Eve were... Um, they had two commands in the Garden of Eden. People think there was just one command. There was actually two when you think about it and actually do the study. Okay? They were commanded to eat from the tree of life to live forever. And they were commanded not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? There was two commands. Do you want to live forever? You've got to eat from the tree of life at that time period, in that dispensation. I know some people are against dispensations, but that's because they're not Bible believers if you're against dispensations. Uh, uh, special meaning for people in winter. Remember, it was because the tree stays green all year. All the other trees, you look out there, I want to do this outside, but I just seem to do better setting down. My knees aren't handling the... When I tried doing this outside, it was like an hour and a half, two hour study, and my knees started hurting, and I started getting distracted, and I missed things that I wanted to say, and not, you know, it just, that my knees are starting to hurt standing in one position for that long. I mean, if I could sit outside for 10 minutes, doing a 10 minute or 30 minute study, Quick study, praise the Lord. Like we might get back to our uh, Bible by the ponds, and I might be able to get out there again. But um, I do better setting down uh, and taking my time and not being in a hurry because my knees are hurting. But I wanted to do it outside. But you look outside. And this, is, this is a window, <laughs> but I use this to cover to help block the light from outside to get enough light so good uh, for the video. But there's a lot of trees out there that look dead. Right. A lot of trees out there. I got this for an example. Uh, this is from a uh, pine tree, sort of type of pine tree, and it's all brown. It's dead. But this is what it looks like when the pine tree drops its needles and gets fresh needles. But there's trees out there that do leaves, and the trees that do leaves, they look like they're dead there in the winter. All the leaves fall off. It's just sticks. Right? Why did they not choose those trees? Because they look dead in the winter. And they're green. They look the pine trees look green and they look alive during the winter. But there's more to it. Remember we talked. It said the summer solstice or the the solstice. Remember you have a summer solstice and you have a winter solstice. Paganism for the Catholic Church. Just as people today decorate their homes during their during the festive season with pine, spruce, and fir trees, ancient people hung evergreen boughs over their doors and windows, and in many countries it was believed that evergreens would keep away witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and illnesses. Yeah. You know what that reminded me of? I had a plate that I told you, Brother Jesus Christ, about, and um, it, had, it was decked with gold and silver. Um, it was actually, um, could be actually be said gilded. That one was actually gilded because it's a plate. Um, but it had a design, it had pictures on it, and one of the pictures it had on it, it was from Japan, and it had the two dogs statues on it. And those dog statues are demon statues that they would put out in front of their homes 
to ward off evil spirits. See, there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. These are all false religions that go back to pa pagan practices that go back to Mystery Babylon. It always is going to go back to Mystery Babylon. All the false religions and pagan practices of the world will go back to Mystery Babylon. Okay. You know what I have that does that? That, that does all that? The Holy Spirit. I don't need a Christmas tree. don't want a Christmas tree. I don't need to take the limbs and hang them above windows and hang them above the door and counterfeit Jesus Christ. I have Jesus Christ in me. His death, burial, and resurrection, He said it is finished. That's what wards off all that stuff that they just mentioned there. Witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and illnesses. Do I still get sick? Yeah. But I'm just saying, I trust the Lord. I don't trust some uh, idol that you, that you set up in your house, or you hang over your window, or you put over your door. In the northern hemisphere, the shortest day and longest night of the year falls on December 21 or December 22nd. And it is called the winter solstice. Many ancient people believe that the sun was a god. Oh, Christmas tree has nothing to do with this. Let's keep reading. And that winter came every year because the sun god had become sick and weak. They celebrated the solstice because it meant that the, at last sun god the sun god would begin to get well. Evergreen boughs reminded them of all the green plants that would grow again when the sun god was strong and summer would return. That's the true origins of the Christmas tree, going all the way back to Mystery Babylon. It's a counterfeit, and we're going to keep talking about this, but it's a counterfeit for the tree of life. It's a counterfeit for Jesus Christ. When it comes, because both, you go to the tree of life to get everlasting life, or you go to Jesus Christ to get everlasting life. Right now, we don't go to the tree of life. It's, it's gone. But when Mystery Babylon was there, there was people there that remembered the tree of life. Remember what God did when he kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He set a cherubim with a flaming sword. They could see the path that led to the tree of life. They just weren't allowed to get to it. Adam talked about it in his generation, his generation, his generation. After the flood, you have uh, Mo uh, Moses being commanded to put cherubim on the tent, the tabernacle. Images of cherubim and stuff like that. And it's like they still knew what the cherubim would, but that means they still knew what the tree of life was. Because that's what the cherubim was guarding. You don't think at Mystery Babylon they had a counterfeit tree of life? Satan likes to counterfeit everything God does and has a pagan and satanic counterfeit. What's the tree? What's the wreath? What's uh, putting all the branches above the, uh, on the door or above the door or above the window? It's a counterfeit for the tree of life and for Je going through Jesus Christ for eternal life. The ancient Egyptians worshipped a god called Ra who had the head of a hawk and wore the sun as a blazing disc in his crown. You know, kind of like Catholicism with the wafer. They hold up the wafer and it's a sun, the huge wafer. It's a sun being raised and you can see the moon, crescent moon that's behind them and they do it right in front of it. It's, it's Egypt. It's Egyptian pagan, paganism that also goes back to Mystery Babylon. At the solstice, when Ra began to recover from his illness, the Egyptians filled their homes with green palm rushes, which symbolized for them the triumph of life over death. No, no, no. Jesus Christ didn't triumph over death. It's we can do it by plant, doing trees and palm branches and everything. Uh, no, Jesus overcame life and death. The Bible says so. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is, where is thy... I think it's grave, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy sting? Jesus overcame. But we're not going to go through Jesus Christ. We're going to go through pagan idols. Now, before you get into it, you're going to say, well, we, 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 we don't do that. That's not why we do that. It doesn't matter why you do that, brothers and sisters in Christ. That is what you are promoting. 
chapter and verse where it pleases God? Oh, you can't do that. So you got to go to traditions of men. And I'm showing you the traditions of men. Where it comes from. What's your attitude? Do you want to please God or do you want to please your flesh? Do you want to turn your back on going through Jesus Christ and start going through a Christmas tree? Well, I'm not doing that. I understand that some of you don't believe this. When I was newly saved and putting up a Christmas tree for Christmas, I didn't believe this. But that's what I was supporting. That's what I was promoting to the world. That it's okay for the lost people to go through the Christmas tree to get saved. You're not to have anything with uh, unfruitful works of darkness, the Bible says. You're not supposed to have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. We talked in our previous study. It's that simple. And it just it amazes me that when God showed that to me, I said, it's gone. I don't want anything to do with it. It's gone. And yet you still have brethren that I love, and I know they love the Word of God to a point. But this is not, you're, proving to, you're just proving that this is not your final authority. This is not your fi the firm foundation. Oh, I'm going to keep my Christmas tree. Why? Well, I do it for my son. I do it for my wife. I do it for my neighbors. I do it for the met people that I work with and everything. But you're not doing it. You're not doing it for Jesus Christ. I have had brethren who vehemently defend for Christmas. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. They admit they do it for their son, they do it for their wives, they do it for their husbands, for your sister in Christ. They do it to please the world. They're not doing it to please God. Early Romans marked the solstice with the feast called Saturnalia, in honor of Saturn, the god of agriculture. The Romans knew that the solstice meant that soon farms and orchards would be green and fruitful. Remember fruit. That's what um, thanks, sir. Uh, Martin Luther, he put fruit, apples, and wafers on the tree. Okay. Green, uh, orchards would be green and fruitful. To mark the occasion, they decorated their homes and temples with evergreen boughs. Homes and temples. What did they do in these Babel buildings on Christmas? They put huge trees in them. I was part of the, the Babel building system. They put trees in them. They put in their temples too. Yay, Roman Catholicism. I'm, I'm being sarcastic because they say, we're not Catholics. Yes, you are. You are Catholics. Closet Catholics. You're practicing Catholic papal tradition over the Word of God. I'm the temple for the Holy Ghost, and I'm not supposed to fellowship with the lost world. You do not invite lost people into your fellowship. You don't say, okay, today we're going to do a Bible study, and there's half the audience is, is saved, and half the audience is lost. You don't do that. It's anti-scripture. But that's what Catholicism does. But look what we read there. Decorate their homes and temples with evergreen boughs. We see it today. And so-called Christianity in the Bible buildings. In Northern Europe, the mysterious Druids, the priests of the ancient Celts, also decorated their temples with evergreen boughs as a symbol of everlasting life. <clears throat> There's nothing new under the sun. They're all doing the same. There's not multiple religions out there, brothers and sisters of Christ. There's, t There's one organized religion out there, and that's Satan, Satan worship. It's all about serving Satan. And we have a personal relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only two gods. Capital G God and lowercase g God. Okay, when you look at it. And, lower, and the, I'm talking about two ways to go. You either serve Satan or you're serving Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Because I know the Bible talks about gods, plural, but they're all on Satan's side. There's only two sides out there. There's not that the deception, there's, it's like Bibles, there's only two actual Bibles out there, Bible versions out there. Catholicism, Catholic Bibles, and the King James Bible, that's God's perfect written word in English. All right. Now I understand I've got, I forgot what it's called, there's a Bible that was before this that wasn't the Bible God chose. But people had to use it because that's all that was available at the time. But God chose this book and blessed this book. When this King James Bible was finished translated, it's the one that went out all over the world. All right. 
but it's a symbol of everlasting life. Now, I want you to think of that, brothers and sisters. Every time you think, well, there's nothing wrong with me putting that Christmas tree up there, is that a symbol of everlasting life? If you put a wreath on your door, is that the symbol of everlasting life? Is that your lowercase g God that saved you? Hmm. The fierce Vikings. One of the brethren are getting really into the Vikings. Born again barbarian. The fierce Vikings in Scandinavia thought that evergreens were the special plant of the sun god Balder. Oh, culture, culture. There's nothing wrong with culture. And your heritage. Stay away from culture and stay away from your heritage. Focus on your new heritage. Created in Christ Jesus on two good works. This will tell you how to live your life, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now understand the boundaries. God set bounds of their habitation. There's only certain types of food normally. I mean, today we're in the last days. But it used to be there's only certain types of food that you could get. So the types of food I ate was based off of my boundary, not culture, boundary. The clothes I would wear was based off the materials I was able to get here in this boundary. My homes, houses looked, had the material that you could get within the boundaries. A good example is out here in Oregon, we have lots of wood. So most of the homes out here are wood homes. But when I was born in, I was, and I go back to visit family in Oklahoma City, there's hardly any trees to the point that most of the homes are brick. Why? Because the area that they live in. Okay, there's, don't mistake in the bounds of their habitation for culture, which we're reading. This is just all culture. There's nothing wrong with them doing this. It's just culture. Yes, it is. It's false god worship. They're going the wrong direction, trying to seek everlasting life in the wrong areas, in the wrong places. Stay away from culture. Stick to the Word of God. Okay. Catholics have been doing Christmas trees since they were created, since they created Christmas around 300 AD. I just want to put that out once again. This all goes back, I'll show the books again, Mystery Babylon. All the way up through Egypt, all the way up through all the pagan, when Mystery Babylon, when God said, uh, gave, uh, made them all have different languages to spread them out, because he, that was the commandment. It had nothing to do with culture. I know some brethren are starting to see culture everywhere. There's culture here. There's culture. It had nothing to do with culture. It had to do with God gave them a command. He gave Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the command to spread out and multiply. There was people in other areas of the world. You had um, um, Shem in another part of the world that was a separate from Mystery Babylon. But they were all coming together and God's like, that's not what I asked him, to, that's not what I commanded him to do. Wasn't asking, I always said that. Command, that's not what I commanded him to do. So he changed their language because language barrier, that's how it separated the bounds of their habitation. And they took that false religion and all those counterfeits of the one true God, the, uh, the Christmas tree is one of them, I believe, and it spread out all over the world to all these different people we just read about. And that's what these books talk about and show how that happened, the transition from Mystery Babylon to Egypt to Roman, Roman the Roman Empire, to Catholicism. Okay. Why would you have anything to do with it? Why would you be promoting it? That's the thing that I don't get. At this point, Brother Jesus Christ, I don't understand why you'd be promoting it. Okay. The lost world would rather put up a Christmas tree, or a wreath, or boughs, yuletide. They'd rather do that than um, go through Jesus Christ for eternal life. The true source of everlasting life is Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, I am not going to lie to you. Did Brian use verses in that study that he put out there? Okay. Uh, uh, because I don't want to get the name wrong. Um, what is the real origin of the Christmas tree? Did Brian use scripture? But let's go over those scriptures. He did. Now still, no actual verses that say Christmas tree, Christmas tree. Some people say Christ Mass, but whether you say Christ Mass or you say Christmas, chapter and verse, 
But when we go over these verses, notice that he still didn't show any verses that say the Christmas tree and the pagan, and it is pagan, I just showed it. It is pagan practice that goes all the way back to Mystery Babylon. It's a counterfeit of the tree of life, and it's a counterfeit of going through Jesus Christ for eternal life. It's a counterfeit. Right. Fir tree, Christmas tree, hmm. maybe they're the same. I can make them out to be the same thing. So we're going to grab Hosea 14.8. And 14.8 actually says fir tree. So we're going to act like that's, Chris, that, that's, that's a Christmas tree. And God's okay with Christmas trees. So if you want to turn to Hosea 14.1, but I'm going to read verse 8 because that's all Brian did. He just read verse 8. He didn't read the whole chapter. Once again, what happened to 2 Timothy 2.15? Was this done intentionally? Right. Verse 8, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. This is God speaking. From me is thy fruit found. Remember that. And that's all he read. And he said, see, green tree. God is like the green tree. And then he starts talking to the green tree. You know? And you know what the fruit is of a pine tree? Pine cones. Because that's how the pine tree um, repro uh, reproduce, <laughs> reproduces. That's how the pine tree, that's the seed of the pine tree that creates more pine trees. That's the fruit of the pine tree. But this isn't saying the green fir tree is fruit. It's talking about thy fruit is found in me. Is what God's saying. He is the true tree of life. I am the door. Jesus says, I am that door. Okay? But you just read that and you see the word green fir tree. What were they doing there? It says, just even on verse 8, where it says they had idols and it's green fir tree. Why would God, if they were doing idols and they had to get rid of their idols, those idols are a counterfeit of who God is. And if God says, I am like a green fir tree, couldn't those idols have been counterfeit trees of life? Uh, a counterfeit of the tree of life where they're trying to go through those instead of going through the one true God? Yeah. But let's read the whole chapter real quick. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Sin. I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know how else to say it. Covetousness, which is idolatry, is sin, brothers and sisters in Christ. Idols, fall, all these false idols, they're sin. Spiritual fornication, where you're inviting and, and starting to worship something to the point where you're treating it like it's a God, along with believing in the one true God, that's spiritual fornication. It is a sin. It is iniquity. Okay, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him. That's my thing to, I'd say to Brother Brian. Right there. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. That's what Brian needs to do. Okay. Was it Psalms 18, 46? The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Verse, uh, Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in my sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That's what I tell Brian he needs to do. He needs to get back to the, his first love, which is this right here, the Word of God, the King James Bible for English-speaking people. He needs to get back to his first love and forsake culture and heritage. He needs to get back to his true heritage, his true life for Christ, living for Jesus Christ. Okay, turn to the Lord, say to him, take away my iniquity and receive us gracefully. So we will render the calves of our lips. Assure shall not save us. It's a false god. We will not ride up not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods. That's what the Christmas tree is. The works of your hands. That's what Jeremiah 10 is talking about. It's the work of your hands. 
For in thee the fathers find mercy. I will heal, heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. That's what I want for the brothers and sisters. Christ. I'm warning you. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. God is angry with brethren that invite false gods in. If you did it ignorantly, remember what the Bible says. At this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth every man everywhere to repent. If you're doing something ignorantly, God has grace. God has mercy. Praise the Lord. But once He's shown it to you and you refuse to let it go, now God's getting angry with you. Okay? I will be as the dew unto Israel. Talking about God. He shall, he shall grow as the lily, Israel, and cast forth His roots as Lebanon. Talking about Israel. His branches shall spread and His beauty shall be as the olive tree. The olive tree is what is used in the New Testament when it talks about us, brothers and sisters Christ, Gentiles being grafted into the olive tree. Wild olive tree being grafted into the olive tree that, that God chose, His chosen people. And this, and, and His smell as Lebanon. Where, another thing too, Solomon, where did Solomon have to go to get trees, big enough trees, to build the house of the Lord and to build His own house? They didn't have those around the most of the Jew, uh, Israel, they had to go outside. And make, he had to make a deal and get these huge trees. Verse three, uh, verse seven. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And we get to verse eight. Ephraim shall say, "What have I to do any more with idols?" The whole con uh, context of this verse is they're giving up the pagan idols. They're going to stop going through these idols to find everlasting life. They're going to stop going through these idols to get their sins, their iniquity forgiven. And they're going to turn to the one true God. It's Jesus Christ. Okay? What do we have to do with idols anymore? Anymore with idols. I have heard him and, uh, and observed him. God says, I am like the green fir tree. For me is thy fruit found. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Who is wise? How do we get wisdom today? We pray to the Lord that through the Holy Spirit, he'll open his word to us. Our wisdom is found in the Lord. Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. How come some of the brethren can't understand what's going on here? Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And God will tell us what his ways are through his word. The ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them. The just shall live by faith. Do you truly believe this is God's perfect written word? And that's what I'm challenging you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that vehemently have turned against me, which is not me, you're turning against God's word. Do you believe that this is God's perfect written word? Then you'll walk in it. Oh, but God gave me a dream and God gave me a vision. To... Chapter and verse. But the transgressor shall fall therein. When you don't get that this is the final authority and you start straying, let's say at one time you stood for this. This is God's final authority. When you start straying from this, you start becoming a transgressor. You start, it's just, it's just, it's a fact. When you put this down and you start going the way of the world, it's always going to be contrary to Scripture and the world's always going to get you to go against the Word of God and you're going to start going against the Word of God. It's guaranteed every time. Okay. Now, here's a question. Can you get fruit from a dead tree? Remember what it said there, from me is thy fruit found. And we're going to talk about the instruction righteousness. This isn't written to Christians. No, it isn't. But remember what the Bible says. Those things that were written before time were written for our learning. What can we get from this? From me is thy fruit found. Can you get fruit from a dead tree? Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, we read, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. And you know what? The brethren are now starting to attack that. The changed life, oh, that doesn't mean you're saved. The love, having a love of the truth, oh, that doesn't mean you're saved. Holding this book as your final authority in all matters of faith and practice, oh, that doesn't mean you're saved. They're attacking the fruits. Right? There's people that can put on a show for a little while, but if you have the Holy Spirit in you and you keep holding the brethren accountable to this, it's going to separate the wheat and the tares. You're going to see the people who are false. You can see the brethren that have fallen away from the brethren that are standing. It's going to also separate the brethren that are still standing. They're all brethren that are saved. It's going to separate those who are still standing for God and those who are falling flat on their face looking at the world. They're no longer looking, looking for Jesus Christ. This is what does it. Their attitude towards truth and the life that they live. The fruit. Matthew 17, 9, we read, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Luke 3, 9, And now also the axe is laid into the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the, into the fire. Remember, we did a study, one of my old studies, talking about good. you can have good fruit, you can have bad fruit, you can have no fruit. There's times where when Jesus cursed the, olive, uh, the fig tree because it had no fruit. It was supposed to have fruit. All the other trees had. He was hungry. It was supposed to have fruit. And he did that as to show us that that's how he feels towards the world. Someone who has no fruit. Okay. But can a, and we did that study about how a Christian that falls away, can they start bearing bad fruit? Mixed in with good fruit. And they'll have to answer for that bad fruit. At the judgment seat of Christ. Everything that was done, the good and the bad. You have to be judged on the good fruit and the bad fruit that you have. I have bad fruit. In my walk with the Lord since I got saved you know, almost eight years ago, I've made some mistakes and I have failed the Lord. There's going to be some bad fruit at the judgment seat of Christ that I'll have to answer for. But I'm doing my best. And I pray that you are too, brother, says Christ, that it's good fruit. Good fruit. Good fruit is what your eyes are on and what your heart's desire is about. Okay? Good fruit, you are of the Lord. Bad fruit, you are of the world and the devil. If all you have is good fruit, or all you have is bad fruit, you're of the world. That's the world. If you have good fruit and bad fruit, you're showing that the bad fruit shows when you went to the world and started acting like the world and started being without not intentionally, but started being a servant of Satan instead of serving your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You started failing the Lord. Okay. Luke 20, verse 38 says, For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. I am like the green fir tree. Why, they, why is it the green fir tree? Why do you have to say green? Because if a fir tree looks like this and it's brown, it means it's dead. But if it's like this, it's alive. We serve a living God. So why would you cut this down and kill it? And start worshiping a dead God. He didn't say in there, uh, Ephraim shall say, What have I to do with more with idols? I have heard him and observe him. I am like the green fir tree that you cut down and put in your living room. That you kill and becomes a dead tree. I'm like that dead fir tree that you put in your living room. Or hang above, hang on your door, hang above your door, hang above the windows. I'm like that. That's not what it said. And it's, and uh, gosh, I just don't know what to say. I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but you need to repent for trying to use that to justify a Christmas tree. Repent quickly. Okay. For God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. Jesus is the lifeline. He is God fully and completely. He's the lifeline, saved and lost, lost. He controls life and death. He overcame life and death. So why are you going through a false god? That's what God Jesus is saying there in Hosea 14. Hosea 14:8. 
when he says, I am like the green fir tree. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Remember when Jesus said that? You go through God for life. Not paganism. You don't turn things into idols and go through them. You say, but I don't, I don't. I understand that, brother Jesus Christ. I understand that some of you aren't doing that, saying this is a God where I get an everlasting life. But you're promoting that. You're serving Satan by promoting that and looking like the lost world and acting like the lost world. Have no, uh, have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Have nothing to do with it. You know, what, what did Jesus tell uh, Peter when he started savoring the things of the world, traditions of men, rudiments of the world? He said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. Why? Because thou savest the things that be of men. Oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to grab Martin Luther as justification. Thou savest the things that be of men and not the things that be of God. We have brethren that, are, uh, that need to be told that. Get thee behind me, Satan. Not that God. Jesus wasn't saying he was Satan. He was saying, by your actions, you're serving Satan. With your actions. With you not trusting my word. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Oh, where in the Bible does it say we can't do a Christmas tree? The Bible says it all through. The Old Testament instruction righteousness, which we just read, how they gave up idols. Jeremiah 10, Hosea 14, Jeremiah 10, they gave up idols and turned to the one true God. And the New Testament tells us we're supposed to abstain from idols and food offered unto idols. And stay true to the one true God. Time and time again, covetousness, which is idolatry. Fornication, spiritual fornication. Our God is a jealous God. Oh, where does it say it? It says it. You just don't want to listen to it. That's the truth. You don't want to listen to the words of God. So you ignore them. Well, where does it say that? Where does it say that? Right here. And what agreement hath the temple of God, your body is the temple of God, with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Not a dead tree that you put in your living room. Or dead wreaths, the limbs that you put on the doors and above the windows. We serve a living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. Works. Wouldn't we just read up there it says, and walk in them? Jesus is walking in me? Yes. Why? Because it's said up there, I am like the green fir tree. From me, talking about God, as we apply it for instruction, right? To Jesus, it's like Jesus right here. He says it right here. And walk in them. I will dwell in them, and I will walk in them. From me is thy fruit found. Works. You're, God's going to come into your life if he saved you. It's an if, but I believe that he saved you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Like I said, your whole life, culture, heritage, your false, if you came out of a false religion, your whole life comes into question after you get saved. You say, Lord, show me the truth and how I'm supposed to live for you. What pleases you and what doesn't please you? And idols don't please God. They, ang they make God angry. I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The olive tree, we are grafted into the Jewish nation. Now are we the sons of God. Now are we the children of God. Remember this song, I serve, I, I say, it's saying it in the last day, but I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I know He is living. We serve a living God. Why does it say green fir tree? Or, yeah, green fir tree? Green is meant, green is because it's alive. He didn't just say fir tree, he said green. If it's not green, when it first breaks off, it might be green for a while, but these are drying out, this is fresh, this is old. This is what it's going to wind up looking like once it gets falls off. It's going to turn brown. Ugly, it's going to decay. The trees fall down, they start uh, decomposing, and they strengthen hillsides. They, they go back into the ground. 
We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior, a living Savior. Okay? That's why it says green fir tree. The green fir trees were green all year round. God is a living God all year round. That sun God that you're worshiping that's getting weak, why would you serve a God like that? He's getting weak and he's getting sick and everything. I, God's saying, I'm the one true God. Why would you promote any of that junk, brothers and sisters of Christ? Why would you even be part of any of that? I'm not trying to be mean, brothers and sisters Christ. I'm trying to get you to check yourself. Check your heart. Make sure your heart lines up with this book. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. God looks at the heart. He looks at the heart. And the root system being in God's soil. You know, we read up there where it talks about the olive tree, and it talks about his branches, and it talks about the roots. Are you rooted in the Word of God? Or are you starting to get rooted in the world and go in the ways of the world? They cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Lebanon. Out here we have a, a tree, it's called a redwood tree. And there's a redwood forest over here. And if you ever come across one of the old black and white, they might brought it to color. When they first came through this area and started logging this area, those my house is a 1,500 square foot home. There was trees whose trunks were bigger than this house. Could you imagine the root system to hold that tree up? If you're rooted here, it's solid ground. Remember, this is the solid ground. We just read that the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Why do you think God's called the rock? Capital R, rock. Sometimes lower case R. But he's likened to a rock, solid foundation. Right? Around here we get trees that get dry rot and they fall down. Trees that the root systems, you can tell, they look kind of healthy on top. But when we get a lot of rain after having a lot of, um, like going through a drought where the ground dries up a little bit too much. And then we get a lot of rain. You can tell the trees that had poor root systems. Why? Because they fall down. You need a strong root system, brothers and sisters of Christ. Jeremiah 10, once again, I go back. I believe here, since God has to liken himself to the green fir tree, saying, I am like that green fir tree, that false that you're cutting down and turning into a false idol, you're trying to replace me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not me, it's about Jesus Christ saying, I am, the, I'm sorry, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm just quoting scripture. Jesus speaking, saying, He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what He's saying here in Hosea. So when you go back to Jeremiah 10, I'm, I, thank the, I thank Brother Brian for sharing this verse with me and letting me go through this verse because it's like, wow, it does line up with Jeremiah 10. They are counterfeiting God and they're trying to go through false gods. And their false god is a tree that they are cutting down and nailing it into one place to keep it upright like a tree still. And they're decking it. And what is the word decked? De the definition of the word decked. You can always tell a scribe. A scribe will say, well, decked, but a better rendering would be gilded. That would be the better rendering. That's called a scribe. I'm not a scribe. I trust the words of the Lord, and the Lord chose the word decked. What does the word decked mean? It means to cover, to adorn. What do you do with the false gods that we just read there as you go down all the way back to Mystery Babylon, what they were doing counterfeiting the Christmas tree? What are they doing? They're covering it and they're decking it. And remember the fruit that they put on it. Counterfeiting the tree of life. Counterfeiting Jesus Christ, who you have to go through today to get eternal life. Okay? Now here's the thing. I still believe Jeremiah 10 is talking about the Christmas tree. And people, I had some brethren that come to me, well, well Brother Brian, he, uh, King, uh, it's not King James Video Ministries anymore. It's um, Born Again Barbarian. I gotta get, remember that. Uh, he put out a great study on Jeremiah 10. I said, really? He changed the word deck to gilded. 
I'm still going to hit him with that because he still hasn't repented. He still hasn't taken that video down and redid it and say, okay, I'm going to redo it and stick to what he believes, but just use the words of God and not be a scribe. Yea, hath God said. He changed the word deck to gilded. It wasn't him saying, hey, deck means this. Here's the definition of what deck means. He replaced the word with another word. And the workman with the axe, you look at the workman, workman is a laborer, someone who does physical labor. You can do a lot of physical labor and not be part of a craft. Okay? It takes a lot of physical labor to cut down trees the old-fashioned way. The Bible says, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show that self approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how we're to labor in the Word. But when it says workman there, it's talking about labor. You're laboring. It takes time and work. Physical labor. He changed workman to craftsman in Jeremiah 10. And he acted like they had all these different tools to chisel the tree out and turn it into a statue. He added to the Word of God. And I'm telling you right now, all over the scriptures, when you start catching him or anybody else doing that, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say if you change the words. Is come in the flesh, has come in the flesh, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Godhead, Trinity, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal. What happened to Brother Brian's uh, fortitude of this is the standard? I'm not going to add to this and I'm not going to subtract from this. You can get the Bible to say whatever you want it to say, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you change the words. Jeremiah 10 and Hosea, we're reading here in Hosea, they had false gods, idols, that they were trying to go through. And could it have been the counterfeit of the Christmas tree? It could have been. But the point is, is it's not, oh, it has to be this specific idol. An idol is an idol! If you're going through, or promoting an idol that, pe that the lost world is going through to get eternal life, and they're not going through God Almighty, you're just as guilty as they are. You're serving Satan. You're acting like the lost world. You're being part of the, f uh, the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. When I pointed that out to some of the brethren, they were shocked, and they stopped for a second. We're going to get into this in another study, but I want to warn you about the real preacher, the, the real preacher that you need to be warned about, because I'll, there's a campaign out there to attack me, and I don't want to go off on a tangent or uh, anything, but I, I'm going to do a study called, you know, the real preacher to watch out for, but the real type of, sa and I'm talking about saved preachers out there to watch out for, and not in a good sense, in a bad sense, like, hey, you might have to stay away from them, or, ta or, or you know, put them out. So God can deal with them and they can repent and forsake with the, whatever wickedness, the wrong ways they're going, being a scribe, Pharisee, Sadducee, and, get, and then you can invite them back in after they repent and get their heart right with the Lord. But the number one thing with brethren, the, the most dangerous Christian, Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman out there today is ones that fall into the trap of respecter of persons. And when I showed this to some of the brethren, they're like, well, uh, that love the Word of God, they're like, I have to go watch that video again and look again. And they're like, you're right. He wasn't given the definition. He was replacing the words. You can get this book to say whatever you want when you do that. Replacing the words. Mm -hmm. All the Westbridge 1820 Dictionary, who cares what the, the, you know, the definition is. Let's not compare scripture with scripture to get the definition of workman or the definition of decked. So be careful, okay? There's false, the false argument still out there being used is, where does it say this, it's a sin to put trees? We already talked about that. Where does it say it's a sin? It says all through here, idolatry is a sin. Spiritual fornication is a sin. Covetousness, which is idolatry, is a sin. You're covering that. Brian has all but come out and admitted that it's traditions of men. So then here's a question that, like I said, I'll throw it right back at Brother Brian. What's more important, that tradition or fellowship with the brethren? That's what I threw out at the very beginning. See how it's all coming together? Like I said, I pray this is opening Brother Brian's eyes and all the other brothers and sisters of Christ out there. What's more important, your tradition of men, rudiments of the world, 
or fellowship with the brethren. What's more important? No, oh, no, no, I gotta have this, I gotta have it. That's called covetousness, which is idolatry. To you, it might not be an idol, but it has become an idol with your covetousness. That you're not willing to give it up for the brethren. Okay? But remember, they're talking about a command. Where are we commanded not to put, cut down a tree and put a dead tree in our house? Okay. Remember, it's idolatry. Where does it say we glorify God with a dead tree? He always likes himself to a living tree. That green fir tree, which is alive, which is why it says green. Even during the winter, it is still green. It doesn't matter how tough life gets for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, or how down you get. God is still alive, and God is still with you. And it's just as frustrating. Holidays. Once again, they, I, I'm a liar because I tell you that holiday and holy day are two different things, and they are. Okay? The Bible says holy day. And the reason Brian loves, Brother Brian loves the word holiday is because if he had to use holy day and only holy day, you have to do a word study on holy day. What the Bible defines is holy day, and he doesn't want to do that. Because what the Bible defines as a holy day is a God-ordained, God-commanded day. Period. That's the definition of a holy day. And it gives you that specific day that he's commanding you why you keep it, how to keep it, when to keep it. That's the Bible definition. But he likes the word holiday because it pulls you away from the Bible and gets you into the world's definition and the world's way of doing things. That's why he hates, he calls me a liar and say I'm deceiving you by saying that they're not one and the same. Um, and he, they, like I said, and they're going to keep hiding this whole thing we've talked about. After I showed this and proved that it's paganism, it's false god worship, that tree is a counterfeit god. Whether you worship it or not, you're promoting it. And by the fact that you can't let it go, means you are worshiping it. Just like with the video games. I talked to the brethren, oh, I'm not addicted, I'm not addicted. It doesn't serve God. It pulls you away from God. It's got a lot of wickedness in almost every video game. Remember what I told you about the uh, movies? How I had to go through my 300 movies? Okay, this is wicked, I have to throw it out. This one's wicked. I did the same thing with my games. Guess what? I came down to zero games. Satan had snuck some kind of wickedness in almost every game that I had on the consoles and everything. These Christmas people are acting like the, the, um, these brethren that are holding on to Christmas, it's life or death, are acting like the video game brethren that are addicted. It's an addiction. I can't let it go. And it becomes covetousness. The only thing I don't let go is this. If I have to live out of my truck, I live out of my truck. If I have to live out of like a little tent on my backpack with a little tent and I'm homeless, this is what I don't give up. Anything else gets in the way of my walk with the Lord, anything else gets in the way of my fellowship with the brethren, it's gone. They can't give up that video game. I'm so addicted, I'm so addicted. It's covetousness that becomes idolatry. The Christmas tree, I can't give it up, I can't give it up. It's idolatry. If anybody sits here after watching this and going through this with me, is still, and all the studies I've done, is still saying that Christmas is a liberty issue, they're being a respecter of persons in a PWC. They're only quoting what somebody else said. They're not quoting the scriptures because I've already proved what liberty, true liberty is in the Bible. Or they really don't care what the Bible says. They want their sin. They want their covetousness. They want their idols. They want their false gods. Uh, Romans 14.5, Romans 14.5. I already proved Romans 14.5 is talking about the holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon that the Bible, the Levitical laws in the Old Testament, um, were commanding the Jews to keep. God was commanding them and calling them holy days and Sabbath days and new moon. We say, well, how did you prove that? Well, verse 6 says, unto the Lord, that day that's above another, that let every man be persuaded in his own mind. That Brother Brian just loves that part. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. That uh, born again barbarian. I wish he'd go back to the original King James Video Ministries, but I want him to go back because he's actually going back to this being his first love. Um, 
but bottom line, it says that one day that's above another is a day unto the capital L Lord. And I put this challenge out to them and to all the brethren out there to learn the scriptures and get the context of Romans and what's going on. He's addressing the Jews in Romans. Jews are coming in trying to get the Gentiles underneath the Levitical laws, circumcision and the laws of Moses in order to be saved. And did the Gentiles, I, I didn't do this in my study, but I'll do this now. The Gentiles, does the Gentiles, before Paul came to preach the Lord, Jesus Christ, to the Gentiles, not lowercase l Lord, not a Lord, not any Lord, but the capital L Lord, Jesus Christ, before he came to preach that to the Gentiles, did they even know who the Lord was? No. No. Did they, if it's culture, as Brian's trying to make it out, when did they have days unto the Lord as lost heathens who didn't even know who God was? Remember Paul, he came to that one town and they had a monument saying to the unknown God. They didn't know who he was. Paul's like, let me tell you who he is. They had no clue who the capital L Lord was. So my question is, is, how did they have days unto the Lord, culture, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, how did they have days unto the Lord? when they didn't even know who he was until Paul and Peter preached unto them. And John, and Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, I can go through a whole list. How did they know? They didn't. So when it's saying a day unto the... Who had days unto the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ? At that time that it was written... Today it's all perverted with the Catholicism out there. Catholic Church perverted everything. But the time that this was written to the, the church at that time, who had days unto the Lord? The Jews did. Only the Jews. Capital L Lord. So I've, dis I've disproved that that, and he says, it clearly says we have liberty. The word liberty isn't even mentioned in that passage. You've got to compare Scripture with Scripture to try to say that it's talking that liberty applies because we're no longer under the Old Testament laws. I've said that. But I'll never be so prideful as to say, this passage clearly says it's talking about liberty. Li the word liberty isn't, isn't even in that passage. You've got to compare Scripture with Scripture to realize it is talking about liberty, but we're being liberated from the Le Levitical laws. In the Old Testament, it was a salvation issue. In the New Testament, it's not a salvation issue. Okay? I've debunked that, but they're still, even after this and after everything, they're still going to keep coming back with liberty. Liberty, liberty, we have liberty. I keep hearing that. A lot of times it's coming from someone, be, be graceful. Uh, uh, have grace, I mean. Have grace. Be humble. A lot of times you will be come across somebody that's a PWC, Polly won a cracker. They're parroting what man, some man that they are being a follower of that man, respecter of persons. They're not following Jesus Christ and His Word. They're following that man, and it's going to be hard to break through that in these last days. The number one thing I think hurting the body of Christ as a whole is respecter of persons. They're trying to get you away from this being your final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And living for the Lord and looking for Jesus every day. To know I'm of Him. And whatever direction He goes, I have to go that way because I'm of Him. He's the cap He's our captain. And I remember Peter Reckman in one of his studies, he's talking about that. Someone said that. Be that as it may. If he's wrong, it doesn't matter. Be that as it may. He's our captain. And that man was corrected by saying, I thought Jesus was the captain of our salvation. We're supposed to follow Jesus. And if the man that you're listening to behind the cameras, includes me, starts going this direction and Jesus is still staying on the straight and narrow, you're to follow Jesus, not that man. Okay? I just proved it. That's not talking about culture and paganism and rudiments of the world. Okay? It's talking about Levitical law. Uh, um, Colossians chapter 2, we did a study on that. And they'll, still, they'll run to Colossians chapter 2 and say, We have liberty! Colossians chapter 2, I've already proven. It, the Levitical laws were nailed to the cross. The, the laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
They're a shadow of things to come. The Levitical laws will come back in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Holy days, Sabbath days, new moon. The ordinances, touch not, taste not, eat not, they will come back in, in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the people there don't have the salvation we do. Their bodies and their souls are still connected. That's why they can't, they, they, there are certain things they can't eat. There are certain things they can't touch. It'll defile the soul because their body and soul are connected. Today, when you get saved, you've got that spiritual circumcision. But I prove that. Okay? Okay, brethren that add justification of idolatry and sin to liberty is sinning against the Lord and His Word. I've been, I've been told I sin against liberty. He's sinning against liberty. Uh, no, I ain't. I'm staying true to the Lord. And I'm staying true to His Word. We have liberty in the sense that we've been liberated from the law of sin and death. When we break, when we break the Levitical laws, you know, don't lie, uh, uh, you know, uh, murder. Uh, remember Paul? Paul was a murderer. He killed, he killed tons of Christians. But God saved him and freed him from the Levitical laws. He was worthy of death and going to hell to burn for all eternity. Okay? We have liberty. We've been freed from that. Today, if we fail the, the Levitical laws, we don't lose our salvation. We don't go to hell and burn for all eternity. Okay? It's a bad fruit. It's something that we may have to answer for. I mean, get that repented. Get that out of your life. Get back to serving the Lord and doing what's right. And we might not have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. But there's good and bad that we're going to have to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. We just don't lose salvation that's not ours. We don't go to hell. That's what liberty is all about. That's why Paul says, don't use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Oh, I'm saved. I can go to heaven now. Then sin doesn't matter anymore. My flesh can go crazy. Because I've got liberty. And that's truth. You do have liberty. You won't go to hell no matter how many sins you sin after God saves you. It will not go to hell. You will not go to hell. But you will have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's why Paul says, hold on, hold on. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We're not to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. The people that are truly sinning against liberty is when they try to make liberty out to be a choice for culture. It's just a choice. That's not what liberty is. Okay? Liberty is what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. He died and rose again so that we could go to heaven. That we could have fellowship with Him and the brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. It's what Jesus did for us that gave us liberty. Okay? And they're trying to steal that from Jesus and make liberty out, or I'm my own God, knowing good and evil. I can decide what's right and wrong. God's no longer the final authority. They'll use things like the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Capital S, Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You mean when someone gets saved, they get liberated from the law of sin and death? But they'll still keep misusing that, that verse. Okay? They say, you have to look in the perfect law of liberty. Yeah, the perfect law of liberty. Jesus was perfect in what Jesus did on the cross, dying for us. It's the perfect law of liberty. I'm not perfect. This body of flesh isn't perfect. It's going to sin. But no matter how many times I sin and fail the Lord, and God picks me back up and puts me back in the right spot, no matter how many times, that perfect law of liberty... I won't lose my salvation, the, God, the salvation that God has given me. I will not go to hell and burn for all eternity. Jesus saved me. Jesus paid that price for me. That's the perfect law of liberty. And you've got brethren that are messing that up and taking away from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've already done these studies. I'm not going into it in, in Scripture because we've done studies on liberty. One of them was like, give me liberty or give me death because they're trying to mess up liberty for flesh. It's what they really mean to say is give me culture or give me death. Give me my flesh or give me death. Give me traditions of men or give me death. Give me uh, rudiments of the world or give me death. And they try to hide that stuff behind liberty by perverting what liberty is in the Bible. 
And we've already talked about this. It's just some that I, I'm reacting to Brother Brian because he's talking about all these verses and he's misusing them to justify traditions of men. Okay. I've been called names. I've been called liberty thief. You're a liberty thief. You're a liberalist. Um, uh, I've been, I'm a pagan. Now, I'm a pagan for being against Christmas trees. I'm the pagan. I'm lost because I'm against traditions of men usurping the commandments of God and the authority of His Scripture. I, I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm lost because I'm for the Bible and not for men. I'm not for the things that be of men, but the things that be of God. But I'm lost now all of a sudden. Uh, Pharisee. I've been called a Pharisee. I thought, see, I'm, I'm actually attacking Pharisees. We'll talk about this in another study. I'm actually attacking Pharisees, and then you get called a Pharisee. I remember Brother Brian, King James, when it was King James Video Ministries, that when he would call people sin out, and when he'd say, hey, thus saith the Lord, this is his commandments, with the uh, Godhead versus the Trinity, uh, the changed life after salvation, the true plan of salvation, there's a changed life. When it comes to the Bible version issue, when it comes to, you know, being sealed into the day of redemption, eternal security, uh, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. People used to call him a Pharisee because they, they kept trying to change the, t the definition of Pharisee. They were the Pharisees calling Brother Brian the Pharisee. Now Brother Brian in that video just switched around and, and just acted like the lost world. And now he's calling me a Pharisee because I'm standing for the Word of God. Now he's changing the definition of Pharisee. Okay. I'm, I'm putting down the traditions of men and the rudiments of the world and uplifting the Word of God. But now I'm a Pharisee and Brian's putting down the Word of God and lifting up culture, heritage, traditions of men and everything. But I'm the Pharisee. For lifting this, I'm the Pharisee. All right. Legalistic Pharisee, yeah. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I'm staying true to the one true God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I will continue to defend this book. I will continue to truly love the brethren by exhorting them and correcting them and getting you back on the right path. And I pray that you do the same for me, brothers and sisters in Christ through the Word of God, and out of love. Not out of anger, not out of bitterness, not out of spite, not because you are so prideful and have an ego that takes up the whole United States, if not the world, but you're doing it out of love. And you do it with respect. All right. Please keep doing that. I'm going to keep standing for the Word of God. See, I'm legalistic, Pharisee, being a Christian. Matthew 15, 6, it says, Honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandments of God of none effect by your tradition. That's what a Pharisee is. Someone who holds traditions of men, rudiments of the world, above the word of God. But now I'm a Pharisee, and if you hold the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, above the word of God, you're not a Pharisee anymore. See, we've got to change the definition of Pharisee. Colossians 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You're coveting something to the point that that's becoming a false god in your life. Is it more important than fellowship with the brethren? No, get rid of it. Nothing is. Get rid of it. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God. This is to Gentiles. How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So then why are you going back to idols? As Gentiles, our heritage is worshiping idols, false gods. That's the cultures of the world. False gods, elevating the flesh, making you a god, and getting you to worship false gods. That's the ways of the world. That's the culture of the world, the rudiments of the world, traditions of men for the most part. It's anti-scripture. It's anti-God. They're against the true God of the Bible. And Satan's going to counterfeit them. We turned from idols to the living God. We need to continue and remain in that, brother says Christ, and continue acting like that and living it. I said acting, but living 
action. Our actions need to show that we serve the one true living God, not confuse the lost world saying, but, but, but you have a Christmas tree? Well, it's not a God to me. It might be a God to you, but it's not a God to me. It doesn't matter. They look at you as like them, and when you try to condemn them for it, you're a hypocrite. Through and through, rightfully so, a hypocrite. Well, when they do the Christmas tree, they do it as a false god and everything. But when I do it, it's not a false god. You're a hypocrite. Through and through. 1 John 5, 21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. There's an amen at the end of that. This is to the Gentiles. Where is the command that we can't do Christmas trees? Right there. Turn from God from idols to serve the living true God. Keep yourselves from idols. Make sure you're, you serve the living and true God. Brothers and sisters Christ, I have every right and duty to do this. To preach the word of God and to tell you the truth. Okay? I'm doing this with love. So I hope you understand that, brothers and sisters Christ. And I know some might get up all agitated. Oh, it's Christmas. It's not a big deal. After what I just read right there and all the studies I've done, if you still believe that it's not a big deal, your heart isn't right with the Lord. And this isn't your final authority. This, the Holy Spirit, is not what's in charge. You're starting to go back to being carnally minded and walking after the flesh and the world's in charge and you're a respecter of persons and that man that set, told me what I wanted to hear, that's, that's got to be the truth and I'm going to follow him instead of submitting yourself to the truth. If that man, this man, doesn't line up with this, you go with what the Bible says. And if that means you have to forsake this man because I get so messed up and so fallen and so out there, then you, first, you break fellowship with this man and you stick to this right here. The Word of God. You don't break fellowship with me for another man that isn't Jesus Christ. You break fellowship with me because this is what I'm going against. And I'm not. Brother Brian is. Stop being a respecter of persons. We'll get into that in another study. But I wanted to end this with a famous verse. Okay. Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. A lot of you know this, and I need to have this by heart. I got some of it by heart, but I want to get the whole thing. Um, did I get that wrong? I still fumble around in the Old Testament. No. It's just, it's a, I skipped it somehow. Went past it too. Just went past it too fast. Joshua 24, 15. See, it goes from Joshua to Judges. It makes me think I was in the wrong spot. <laughs> Both starts with a J. Uh, Joshua 24, 15. And I'm going to leave you with this. So I'll say this now. I, I started this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean that. Grace and peace from God our Father, the one true living God. Be with you, brothers Christ. That's what I want for you. And the only way we're going to have grace and peace is if this is our foundation. The Bible says we're supposed to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. We all need to be on the same page. We all need to be striving together. And the only way we're going to do that is if this is our foundation. We all have the exact same foundation. But if you're trying to use this and the world as a foundation, we're never going to get along. You need to use this as the final authority, and this is our only foundation in all matters of faith and practice. Not traditions of men, not rudiments of the world. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, where the gods which are... Your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites, in whom land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray that you're, you choose that last part. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you for watching.